Hello, my name is Rachel Vandenberg, and welcome to today's episode of the Travel Leader Podcast. And today I'm here with Leah Murphy from Jane Hotel Group. Did, I think I got that right. Is that you correct? You sure did. You sure did. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to talk to you today and have a, a great discussion about leadership in the hospitality and travel space. Um, let's start. Let's jump right in. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So um, I started my company, Jane Hotel Group, last year, and this is a private hotel investment company um, looking to acquire hotels within the Midwest United States either in the independent um, independent space or potentially branded space too. So we're, we're a brand new company and um, I'm excited to, to grow and prosper. <laughs> That's awesome. So thank you so That's much awesome. for having me today. I'm really excited to, to chat. So what, what got you into hotel investment? So I have a history in the hotel consulting and appraisal space. I was actually in that space for about 14 years. Um, started my career with HVS San Francisco in 2007 and then moved to Los Angeles to help build uh, the office there and got a little tired of the California scene and was looking for a change and got an opportunity to join Cushman Wakefield's hospitality and gaming platform. And so we relocated to Milwaukee and I joined their team was there for about six years. Most recently, I was the national practice lead for consulting and valuation in the hospitality and gaming space, had about 20 appraisers and consultants under me. And I was struggling. I was struggling in that I wanted to make a difference in the hospitality space. And there's, you know, certainly a lot of things that you can do as a consultant and appraiser, but I felt I had reached the end of my runway there. And I was looking for an opportunity to make changes. And I thought the best place to do that was from a hotel owner's perspective. And plus, I'd always been interested in being a, a hotel owner. You know, I'd spend all this time helping owners and managers and brands and all these different groups in the hotel space but I myself was never in the owner's seat. And so I wanted to be a part of that and also be a part of the change in demographics with um, hotel ownership. Right now it's, it's typically dominated by um, men and in particular white men. So I was excited to be a part of the, the next generation of women that are interested in getting into that space. So that's where I started my company. That's great. Um, so talk a little bit. Um, you mentioned that you were struggling and that you were really interested in making an impact on the industry. Um, what what was spe specifically, you know, comes up for you with that? Right. Well, so I started my career in hospitality and food and beverage. Um, I worked at a Marie Callender's restaurant and um, started as a hostess and worked my way up and thought I was always going to stay in food and beverage, was trying to do as many different jobs as I could. And so I, I saw what the grind of the industry can do to employees there. Also saw it as I evolved into hotels. And while I was at my final days at my um, previous company, you know, I just kept hearing the same story over and over again from ownership saying, you know, struggling with employees and I don't know what to do. We don't have employees. We're, you know, the shortage that everyone's very well aware of. And I think there's a lot of demographic reasons why there was a shortage, um, including the pandemic and other things. But I also feel like there was a fundamental problem in how employees were getting treated in hospitality. They were always, you know, very bare minimum wages, not not a lot of benefits, not a lot of flexibility, not a lot of time out um, for their families, which I'm really pleased to see that a lot of companies are shifting that way. But I think there's more that we can do. And I'm convinced that there's a way to do that and still have a profitable business. And so that's where I'm like, you know what, if I want to make a change in this space, I need to go and figure this out and find like minded folks that are also in that space that still have the same passion for hospitality, but also are, are tired of the same narratives in the employment space. So 
that was really my big motivation to start my business. Yeah, that um, I can so real, you know, relate to that. Um, you know, as a hotel owner myself, you know, not not necessarily uh, always a, a conscious choice for me, but kind of falling into it. Um, that you know, there, you know, when you are in the driver's seat, you really have that ability to you know, use your agency to change how the company is being, re being run. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I commend that, you know, that goal and that impact. Um, because I do think if anything, you can actually be more profitable, um, than, you know, and it, having any detriment, uh, you know, just by person. reducing turnover, you know, and, um, other labor costs in that space, I think would, will be huge. Um, and then the the loyalty and the the ability for employees who generally who genuinely have their needs met, they're going to be that much better at their job and that much better facing with their guests. And it just the trickle effect at the um, at the hotel itself and then the surrounding community. It's just it can be huge. So yeah, I mean, passionate. and it sounds. Yeah. I mean, and it sounds like, you know, you're not just looking for like your inward focus from a hotel owner standpoint, but that you're actually looking to model this way of, of operating a hotel business and being an example for, from a structural standpoint for industry wide. Absolutely. And I, I think we're at such a great moment in, in the history of um, hospitality as well as the world really where you know working from home and having flexible hours and you know the conversations about well what what's really needed for wages and there's just such there's such movement in the industry that I think this is the time to really shake things up and be like okay let's throw maybe not the entire uh, rule book out the window, but, but a good portion of it. And then let's see, let's see what else we can do. Let's, let's shake things up. Yeah. Would you say that, um, that grabbing on, uh, to opportunities like that, you know, and seeing, you know, trends or the space to make change is, is that a theme for you in your career? Well, I would say that yes and no. Um, I'm a very strategic thinker. I love, you know, thinking in that space and brainstorming and getting creative. And I'm also um, a huge proponent of efficiency because, look, there's only so many hours in the day. And, you know, as important as our jobs are, we all want to have a personal life and um, have time to do other things, too. So that's always been a, a forefront of what my leadership style has been is like, what can we do better? Never satisfied with just the way things have always been. Um, Cause you know, little tweaks here and there can really make a huge difference. I think, you know, there's been times where I've been inspired to make big changes and, um, you know, take the leap, but I haven't always done it because I haven't been in the right season of life. I would say, you know, personal things going on where sometimes the security of the status quo sometimes is important. And sometimes you just mm -hmm. need to to get through that so that you can, you know, tick the boxes of, um, of your responsibilities at that time. And then when you're ready, um, then you can really make the big leaps. And that's where, you know, the timing for me and starting Jane Hotel Group was things were aligning where I finally was at the season of life where I had some stability, I had some support. So it was really time um, for me to be able to do something creative and different. So, yeah, I love the intentionality of your story, you know, and, you know, really making being considerate of your, yeah, your timing and your purpose and impacts that you want to make, um, that it's not just on a whim, it sounds like. Right, right. Well, you know, yeah. I, I sometimes I get crazy ideas and then I go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got to, you know, come back down to earth and uh, think yeah. things through a little bit more. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so that's a perfect segue into one of my other questions, because, you know, you just described a little bit about your leadership style um, being strategic, um, for example, and and always working to improve and continue con- con- like the continue and pr- continuous improvement um, kind of pathway. How do you think others would describe you as a leader? <sighs> I think it was while well, I was thinking about this, um, I think the first thing people would say um, is that I have really high standards and I'm, I'm, I can be tough in terms of what, you know, I expect my team members to contribute and to do. Um, but I also think they would say that I am very caring and thoughtful and, you know, not just in, in the work environment, but I really do care about my team members, um, whole selves. So their personal lives, things of that nature, um, and, um, and how they're doing as a whole person, not just how they're doing at work, because a firm believer that if things aren't going well outside of work, then it's really hard to make work Mm -hmm. go well. Um, so I would say that I would say, um, I I did think of stubborn, but I was trying to think of a nicer word than stubborn. Uh I was like maybe steadfast or (laughs) some, uh, some other aspects, but I, I am always approachable. Um, you know, if people have questions or issues, I have an open door policy, always willing to listen. I may not always agree, but I'm always willing to listen. And so I think that's a really important thing as a leader to take the time to, you know, keep your, your long-term goals in mind, but then also realize that maybe the exact path that you had envisioned isn't always the best. And so being flexible enough to pivot when needed. Yeah. 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 I mean, just going back to what you were saying about that, you know, that distinction between, you know, sometimes those are going to be two sides of the seesaw, right? Like the, the high standards you know, yet also, you know, really thinking about the people who, you know, those high standards impact and Mm -hmm. caring about them as individuals. Um, Can you think of an example when, you know, those two, those two attributes of your, your leadership maybe came into conflict and how you resolve that? Yes, I think, it's that, it's that, I think the way you described it, the seesaw is so perfect. It's that balance. It's that, and it's that where you want. So when I was in consulting and valuation, you know, you're providing a product, you're providing um, market study, feasibility study, an appraisal, something. And so there, you can spend hours and hours on it and make it the most pristine document um, ever. But then you also have a timeline that you're trying to adhere to. And you're also managing a business and you're also managing multiple clients and multiple projects in addition to your own personal um, life too. So sometimes there is times where you get so focused on the perfectionism on the best possible product for your client, but then you have to draw a line somewhere and say, look, Mm -hmm. this is, you know, based on the timeline, based on what I did, this is the best I can do. Um, But I will say What I always tried, um, what I always strove to do was to make sure I was always meeting my clients' expectations. And so keeping that communication channel open, Mm -hmm. constantly letting them know where, um, if there were changes, if there were, you know, things that they needed, making sure that I understood their needs and wants from this whole experience and that I was meeting those. So it's that that seesaw, that balance, that in between. So I felt like that was a constant struggle for me um, personally. And then, you know, sometimes my team members would have to remind me of that too. So um, Mm -hmm. that was, that was a regular occurrence. Yeah. I mean, I could, I can totally, I could relate to that perfection and, you know, perfectionism tendency, but I try, I try to learn and from that saying, you know, done is better than perfect or something, yeah. or <laughs> there's some saying like that. I forget exactly what it is, but yeah. yeah well, okay. I mean, like, you know, you've got, you, you were a hotel owner and you've got multiple guests. So one guest may have a problem mm-hmm. and you're going to do everything you can to help them and resolve it. Is it going to be absolutely perfect? Well, 
maybe, but you also have other guests and other things that you have to address and handle. And if you, you know, slack off there, then it, it, then the, the whole disruption starts. So it is that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So taking a step back a little bit into your, your past, um, uh, as, uh, in your career, when did you first know that you were a leader? I think this is a great question because I think it depends on how you define a leader. So there, I would say as a leader in terms of, I could, you know, lead a group of people towards a common goal. That was probably high school for me. Um, you know, I was part of a couple extracurricular activities and, um, clubs and things like that. And so, you know, people are like, Oh, we need someone to be in charge of this who can step up to do it. And I, you know, cautiously raise my hand and be like, well, I guess I could do it. Um, but I think something that I've, I've known for a long time is, um, when I speak, people listen. And so I think, you know, as a young child, whenever um, I would share an opinion or, you know, I, I, I would get the feeling that multiple people were listening and paying attention, but I didn't, you know, as a child, I didn't know what to do with that. So I think that's, that's a, a character trait of a leader is being able to speak in a way that you're um, acknowledging the people that you're around and that you're servicing them and that you can talk to them and get them to, to get on board for the same common goal. So Mm -hmm. that I've noticed, I I have the ability to do that for a while, but I just didn't know, I didn't have the self-confidence to know what to do with that until probably, probably high school. So. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it sounds like you, you recognized that you were making a connection with people and that, that had like, that had influence over them. And that's definitely having influence is a big part of leadership. For sure. Right. Right. That, that ability to connect, um, with another person is so important as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. So when do you feel, um, when, when do you feel when you are being the leader that you imagine or hope for? Say that, say that one more time. When do you feel like you are being the the leader that you imagine you want to be? Oh gosh, when do I feel like that? Well, I would say when everything's going absolutely perfectly and everyone <laughs> is listening and agreeing and um, not agreeing, you know, wholeheartedly with blindness and not, you know, fully understanding what's happening, but a little bit of interaction, a little bit of yeah. Okay. That sounds great. Yeah. Let's do it. And, um, I also think that's a little bit part of my personality too. I don't know if you've done Enneagram stuff. Um, but I'm a type nine, which is very much a a peacemaker and they're constantly aware of how everyone's doing and, you know, making sure that everyone's taken care of. So I feel like when that is happening as a leader, I am just over the moon. I'm like, perfect. Everyone's getting their stuff addressed. We're all on the same page. We're moving forward. This is, there's nothing better. So that's, yeah. that's how I feel. Yeah, no, that, that definitely is a good, it's always a good reinforcement that you, yeah. When, when you're getting those positive results from your leadership, um, Have you, done you know, I've also, analysis no i haven't i oh, actually you haven't you're fun yeah you know if my husband was here he'd be rolling his eyes because i love you yeah. know that's part of the self-discovery the constantly improving constantly saying you know um, what can i do better so i think the more that you understand yeah. yourself you know the better you can grow and improve yourself and so i love those you know personality assessments and all that stuff so absolutely and i'm a i mean i'm a firm believer that the you know in all of my work on leadership and in my leadership coaching that I do, that if you can't first have that, that first level of self-awareness and humility to even ask yourself those questions and to dive deeper in, into yourself, um, you know, the, the rest is not going to come as easily. You have to at least be able to do that first for Sure. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
You know, I mean, going back to the the, the last point for a minute, um, you know, I, so one of the things that's been surprising to me in leadership is that also in those moments that are of so-called failure, mm -hmm. right, is and how you react to those those moments can also be, you know, reaffirming in mm -hmm. in your ability to lead. Can you think of moments that you've had like that? Yeah, I think there's been moments, so kind of going back to me wanting to constantly put my best self forward, my best product forward, my best service forward, um, there's been times where I've missed the mark. And I was completely devastated by it, um, where I got feedback from a client once, you know, they were thinking I wasn't handling something properly. and I. Um, took it very much to heart, but I also had to take a step back and, and, you know, think about like, well, again, I'm trying to do, um, the best service that I can. And this is an opportunity for me to revisit how I had it all lined out in my mind and like, well, what can I do to make this better? And so, um, even though every time I had to call this client, I had to give myself a little pep talk like, okay, <laughs> you've got this because I already know they're mad at me and I missed the mark. So um, trying to acknowledge what happened and, but then making action steps moving forward to make sure that doesn't happen again and that it gets resolved and that ultimately they're satisfied with what was, what was um, put together. But I tell you um, during that multi-week project, um, Every single time I had to call them, I would like sit there and be like, all right, we got this. Um, again, we're trying to move forward. I'm trying to do my best and I'm doing my best and I'm going to be open and honest and listening to them and seeing what we can do to make it better. Yeah. So how do you think that evolved your leadership, like from a more structural standpoint? So I think it made me um, become a better listener. <laughs> you know, you get, especially when you're in the same industry for a while and you're doing the same stuff over and over again, I think you're not necessarily in a rut, but you're in a routine. You're like, oh, I've done this before. And, you know, sometimes you don't take the time to, to think through the steps that you've always done. Um, but it's, it's made me just be much more much more communicative with the people that I'm working with. And although that can sometimes slow the process down, I think it's just so critical to make sure that everyone's on the same page and that, you know, the, um, the steps for fixing an issue are outlined clearly and, and to make that very, very much aware to everyone involved. And so I think that was a big, a big step is to acknowledge that sometimes things are going to go wrong. And what are we going to do about it? And so making sure that that conversation happens early on, um, you don't want to be like a, a stormy cloud on, on whatever you're working on. But I think having right. that channel saying, hey, just, you know, let's work together. Let's work together on this. And if something's not going right, let's talk through it and we, we will get there. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like, too, like it was a reminder to like always look at things with fresh eyes you know, even yeah. if you think that you have the experience, you know, and you've, oh, I've done this before, where the situation might have been a little bit different, you know, and absolutely. And I think that was part of why it was such a, uh, you know, dagger to me personally, because like I was saying earlier, I, I pride myself on constantly trying to improve things, trying to make things better, trying mm -hmm. to, trying to, grow and improve. And sometimes when you get in the grind, you, you don't always have the appropriate amount of time to adjust. And mm -hmm. so it's important to take the time to adjust. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it, anyone with like those perfectionist tendencies too, it's like, you know, I mean, just speaking from my own experience, it's like, Oh God, like I, you know, I didn't do this right. I should have, you know, right. it's, and 
you're not and it's going back to that idea of high standards really mm -hmm. right like that actually the highest standards we have are for ourselves you know often yep we sure do <laughs> yeah. Very true. yeah yeah um so um you know moving on a little bit um to kind of what you're involved in now and how you've mm -hmm. transitioned your career um, we, we talked a little bit about, um, already what moved you into that change, but in general, what inspires you to get involved into a new project or initiative? I think I love creative ideas. And so something different and new, um, and innovative is, is always very attractive and in, um, inspiring to me, but also something that can produce change and can can help people, I think is is such a critical piece to it too. So if you've got something creative and new and innovative that's also going to be helping a significant number of people, then those are just my sweet spot. And I immediately like, yeah. ooh, what's this? What is this about? And I think those are the things that really motivate me and inspire me. Yeah. And do you, by, do those kinds of attributes become like, like criteria or filters by which you say, Oh, I'm no, I'm not going to do this, but yes, I will be, I will do this. I heard a great quote the other day and I'm, and I'm trying, and I'm, I apologize. I don't remember where I heard it from, but it was something along the lines of you get asked to do something because, you know, we're all busy professionals and we're constantly getting asked like, Hey, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? Right. Um, and if your response, and it's not just, you know, in your mind, but your whole body, you know, if your bot, if your whole, if your response is not a hell yes, then it's a no. Yeah. Because there's so many things that you do where you're like, yeah, it's kind of, that's all right. Yeah, it's cool, I guess. And, and it's just, I want to be working on things that inspire me and motivate me and just awaken my soul. And so I try to take the time to listen to how my whole body's responding and how my mind's responding. And then also keep in mind my goals with what I'm trying to accomplish. And so those are my main barometers for deciding on which projects to take. That's, that's great. That's such sage advice, I think, because, you know, that, like you said, as leaders inherently, we do get asked to do so much or we want to do so much because we want to have an impact on the things that we're passionate about. And it's hard to like have a clear, like what's, you know, more important than another thing. Um, exactly. And then you don't want to get bogged down with like 20 things that you're like, meh. Right. You know, and like, and like, what did I just accomplish? Like, yes, maybe I'm doing things, but it's not, it might not yeah. be for me. It might not be for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I started um, this podcast was because I feel like as leaders and, um, you know, in, in my perspective as a hotel owner that I often feel like I'm on an island yeah. and, you know, you can feel very isolated um, and lonely in a leadership position um, unless you're actively seeking out, you know, that, that camaraderie. So, um, so that led me to think about this sentence and if you can fill it in at the end, um, mm -hmm. am I the only one who feels like <sighs> Am I the only one who feels like this is just never ending? I just feel like, you know, you have these, especially as an entrepreneur too, is it's hard to celebrate the moments that do go well because you still have so much else that you want to accomplish. So there's times where I feel like it's just never ceasing, never ending. And, um, so I try really hard to, when I start to feel that way, to take a moment and saying like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm probably 
may be getting close to burnout and need to do something for myself and to recharge. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that was what I thought of when you, when you said that. Yeah. Yeah. I just got this feeling of that, you know, there's that heaviness, you know, like there's that in those challenges that come mm -hmm. constantly across our paths. Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, they're, they're, they're always there and learning how to work those, work through those things in a healthy manner. Um, mm -hmm. for sure. So I'm pretty sure that our listeners would agree you are not alone and you're not <laughs> the only one. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. I'm, I'm very glad yeah. to hear it, but I feel like it's, it's one of those things no one wants to talk about, right? They want to talk about the glorious, the, the, um, the cool stuff about being an entre entrepreneur, but there's also that, that, um, there are those heavy, heavy parts to it too. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the other reason why I, I seek out conversations like this, because, you know, we don't talk about those things. We, we tend to talk about only what's that so relevant at that moment, which is usually involved in, you know, business trends and, you know, things that are, that are, directly related to our bottom lines, you know, and to our, to the business that we're working in. Um, so that's very much what these conversations are about is creating space, you know, for what really does take up a lot of our time as entrepreneurs and, and in the travel industry, for sure. Absolutely. So if you, you know, thinking like, as if, you know, our listeners and our other podcast participants were your, um, like a board of advisors. Mm -hmm. What's a, what's a big challenge, um, that, you know, and without having to maybe get into something specific, but, um, a challenge that, um, you would love to have advice or, um, experience from this board of advisors about. Hmm. I, something I'm struggling with right now is managing short-term goals with long-term goals. And I, you know, because you have to, there's work that you have to do to set up for long-term goals and things, but then you also have like your short-term stuff that you have to get done in order to achieve the long-term mm -hmm. stuff. So the balance between the two um, is, is what I, I have a real challenge um, with managing. And, you know, some people have told me, like, oh, don't worry about the long term stuff. Just focus on today and what you need to get done. And then the long term stuff will come. And, and that's very true. That can happen. But I also feel like, well, then your, your long term stuff is just kind of floating wherever. And so you're focusing day to day on short term stuff. And then you're going to look, you know, three months, a year later and be like, how did I end up here? <laughs> like, This is not, this right. is not what I wanted to do. But if you're spending too much time on long term stuff, then you're missing opportunities in the short term. So yeah. I, you know, and I, I just had this conversation with my husband because he's like, well, why are you worried about that stuff in the, in the future? You know, you've, you've got, you know, you've got to get a hotel and you've got to do this. And, you know, I'm working on, on acquiring a hotel right now, which is great. But then there's these big arching questions of like, okay, how does this hotel that I'm trying to acquire fit into the long-term goal and, you know, capital that I'm trying to raise the investors that I'm talking to. How is that going to fit into the long term long term vision and goal of Jane Hotel Group? It's like, well, you know, you need them for this hotel that you're buying right now, and I'm like, well, that's great, but again, yeah. So that's where I would love, you know, someone who's been seasoned and um, has been through this journey, <sighs> how the heck they manage it. So <laughs> yeah. Well, so we're going to, I'm going to try an experiment that, okay. so with my, with my next um, participant on the okay. show, we'll actually um, address that question and Ooh. see how we pass along the wisdom, because, you know, I really think that, you know, as a cumulative, you know, group of leaders in our industry, that we all share pieces of the puzzle you know, and we've all had experiences, um, that can help, 
somebody else. And someone might be, you know, more experienced in one area and someone in another area. And that is just like, to me, the most like wonderful thing about building relationships. Um, I think in any industry, but, you know, sure. particularly I love doing it with other travel and hospitality people. Um, so we'll, I'll definitely make sure you hear that episode. When oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, uh, to, and to wrap up today, um, the news of the day, it's all over the place. Um, it's gone viral, this term quiet quitting. So have you heard have you, or seen any of these articles that have been put going around? You know, I haven't. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I think I certainly heard of the great, um, Resignation. Resignation. I was like, yep. regression, recession. Nope, nope. That's not the right word. Yep. <laughs> uh, resignation, um, which technically I was part of. So right. I very, in the whole quiet quitting, I, I can completely relate to because, um, you know, I very much felt that way with my previous job. It's like, I'm done. I'm done. And, um, but it, it, it wasn't a new feeling. It, it just, I was finally yeah. to a point where I was ready to, to do something about it. So that's yeah. interesting that that's becoming an actual movement too. Yeah. So it's a, it's well. a new term. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I, I, I think it's a new term for, you know, things that have already existed and, you know, what it's being specifically referring to is this idea that people are um, only doing what is exactly required of them. Um, in their job and not doing things above and the but beyond or outside of their job description. And it's also been in talked about in relation to the context of burnout and things like that. Um, but it's also really, you know, if you're doing what's required, you know, some people are also calling that that's just good boundary setting you know, and you like, Hey, we've been overworking ourselves for, for way too long. It's time to start taking care of ourselves. Um, so, you know, that's, if, if you were to relate to this, to your work now, you know, what does this mean in the context of the new business that you're trying to, to build up? First of all, I love and empower people for the boundary setting because I did not and it, I was lucky, I'm very lucky to have a partner who he works really hard too. And he probably doesn't have great boundary setting either. And so we're both all in for our jobs. And so, you know, we both understand like, look, I got to grind right now. You're like, okay, yep, I get it. So I think that's been really helpful. But then that's also been a challenge because then we both find ourselves just burnt out completely over it, defeated. And then, and then what are you left with? So yeah. I, you know, that's a big thing as my company continues to grow is I want to support people and their whole selves, not just their work selves so that they can come to work as their best selves. So I applaud the boundary setting, but then I also recognize as an employer, that's going to be incredibly challenging to manage if we still follow what has traditionally been the operating model. So now this is where yeah. the push, pull, the give, take. And I think being open and honest with your employees being like, look, I want to make sure that I'm giving you what you need to be the best employee here and your best self. But I need guidance too. you know, let's make yeah. this a partnership. Let's work together and finding the best way to do this. I need to have a profitable business so that you continue to have a job. But I also want to give you the space where you can grow and succeed so I can continue to have a profitable business. So it's this, this cycle that it, and it needs to be collaborative. So that's, I guess, my biggest takeaway from it. But you know, that's very easy to say too. Like, well, what are the actual items here that we, that we need to do? So. Yeah, but I, I love that because I think what you're pointing out is that one thing is that, you know, boundaries setting means different things for different people. Yes. So you, there's not just, you know, one size fits all for the people you lead. And um, 
Secondly, that idea of the collaboration, you know, with the people that you work and getting and and getting that feedback from them um, is so critical um, because I think, you know, one of the things that comes up for me with this this term is like the term quiet quitting sounds like so much like a disengaged employee yeah, who exactly. is basically like sticking it to the man. Yeah. <laughs> You know, right? Like, well, I'm just going to do only what's necessary. And so much, I think, could be avoided with it getting there if you're having those open dialogues so with true. the people that you work with. Like, hey, where are you at right now? You know, what what's your level of commitment? You know, well, does it and work I think, for you? Absolutely. Because I feel like when I hear that term, most people don't walk in the door on day one with that attitude. You yeah. know, like I'm only doing the bare minimum. There are some, there are some, <laughs> but I think that's what you have to gauge a little bit in your hiring processes too. But, you know, usually on your first day of employment, you're excited to be there. You're excited to learn. You're excited to make some money and you're excited to grow and develop and, you know, all those things. So it was a slow trickle to get to that point. Um, you know, something yeah. else I thought of too, it's about respect. I feel like as well as employers being respectful to your employees. And then then in turn, you know, like, look, I will give you this respect, but then I expect that respect as well. I expect respect for when you're here and you're working for me and, and my company and my goals that you are dedicated, but I also respect you and I will give you Let's meet in the middle there. Let's let's find that that balance to to make this work. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. But this is yeah. I kind of love it though too. Like you know, it's. I mean, I'm sure you were raised this way too. Like, just put your head down, work hard, don't ask questions, or don't you know, rock the boat. And then if you put in your time, then you'll be given the opportunities to to grow and leadership and things like that. And then, you know, for those of us who did that, and then you got to a leadership position and then you weren't respected and you weren't, it wasn't this glorious place that you thought it was going to be and be like, wait a minute. I was, I was, <laughs> I was told that if I did all this, then it would be amazing. Right. So, you know, instead of working towards that, eventually get there, why don't we start at the beginning? Why don't we start at the very yeah. beginning there and then grow together? So yeah. And I think what you pointed out is that it's also, you know, what, about the responsibility of each person. It's the responsibility of the leaders and it's the responsibility of the person yes. to, you know, to initiate those conversations together, yes. you know, yes. and not just assume that the other one, the other knows what's going on, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Leah, this has been a wonderful conversation. I have learned so much um, in this uh, our short time together. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank and you. I, I just... love the conversation. Great questions. Yeah. And just to, to wrap it up, is there anything you would like our audience to know further about Jane Hotel Group? Gosh, um, stay tuned. We are growing, um, growing business, but um, we got lots ahead of us. So more to come. And um, like I said, we're working to acquire a hotel and I'm really excited about it. And I, I can't wait to share more. That's awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much. Awesome. Have a great day. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, you too.